Sarah Albad, we here from Horse Racing Nation, joined by Chase Sessoms at of Oakland is where you can find him on Twitter. Podcast host we have going on now is the opening of the Oakland Meet. It's your playground. It's your time to shine. Yeah, it's the it's the ancestral home. Uh, wolves of Oakland are, are uh, migratory animals, so we we migrate back to our ancestral home this time of year. Uh, so yeah, I'm I'm excited for it. Uh, I love that they've changed the meets up to where basically I get Oakland in the same calendar year each year, so I don't have to wait until the ne- next year. It just rolls right over into December. And since you follow a circuit so closely, I mean, there's so many benefits to giving a track your time and energy and your focus more so than kind of trying to play all over the place or just going where those big stakes races happen. Are there any tips, tricks, or things that you've noticed about Oakland specifically that could help out someone that's just tuning in there for the first time? You know, uh, there are certain trainers that I like to play heavily early in the meet. I'm thinking specifically of uh, like Ingrid Mason uh, with her Muddy Water Stables horses. Uh, and then there are other, you know, bigger trainers I like to fade early in the meet, uh, like Steve Asmussen. I usually try to try to stay away from when it gets, uh, you know, uh, when it's in the, the opening days. Uh, on the six furlong sprints, love the far outside uh, posts. Um, the short stretch mile always has its own little specific kind of, you know, idiosyncrasies that, uh, you think you would play completely to early speed, but you'll you'll find that there are, are a lot of off pace horses that get there. It's uh you know it's been really interesting because of them building the the new huge hotel to go along with the casino. There is over the last couple of years, it's really kind of seemed to to shift how it plays a little bit, and so it seems like now that the construction's done, maybe there's going to be something new to find, and you just kind of have to to play and watch and give it your attention and try to try to pick up on those sort of things. So. You know, uh, I, I'm sure we'll run into all sorts of things that I forgot to mention, uh, w- you know, when you ask me this question. So, you know, uh, just that's the best thing I can give, especially with what the weather is going to be like this weekend. Just watch intently and, and see what the track is doing. And two, I think that while you are out there, obviously, on social media, your podcast is one that I listen to that I've been a guest on several times. And I, I'm trying to beat Matthew DeSantis for most guest appearances on there, or at least keep it an interesting neck and neck tie for the uh, foreseeable future. I feel like a lot of people are kind of sleeping on your handicapping skills in a way, because every single time I talk to you, you give out something really valuable and a little bit sneaky in a way that it's differing from what normal people might be playing, or it might be a place where you're zigging and they're zagging or something like that. Because I mean, you gave out Forte as your single in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. You were fading K Rock completely. Um, When we talked on your podcast about a pick five sequence at Belmont at the Big A, I mean, you were alive to some juicy payouts (laughs) in the last leg and and you yeah. had a horse that I know it's it's a terrible uh, memory, but I mean, you singled a five to one, even if people just bet a couple of dollars on that horse, you had everything right going into the last leg and you had the runner up at like 17 to one, I think it was. And you were looking at what, 40, 50 K coming home to you if that hit. So yeah. don't sleep on your of Oakland tip sheets at picks.horseracingnation.com because Every single time we chat, there is something new that I learn and something valuable for all of the listeners as well. You know, it's uh, I guess it's the upside of being regarded as a pretty weird dude for the majority of my life, uh, thinking outside the box a little bit. It's not a bad thing. And I think that, you know, when we're younger, being a little bit outside the box and differing from the norm is something you get picked on. But when you're an adult, it's appreciated as having more diverse ways of thinking. So I appreciate you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. And, you know, I always appreciate you showing up on the show. You and Matthew have like a like a Celtics Lakers kind of rivalry going. So uh, right now he's the Celtics, but I feel like you're making making a run at him. <laughs> And I hope it stays that interesting forever. But you and I are going to talk about some of the stakes races that are coming up at Oaklawn for opening weekend. And we're going to start off with a race that's actually on Friday. And I think this race is so exciting because we see the return of Tyler's Tribe, who tried the turf in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf Sprint. Um, Didn't have Lasix that day, reportedly bled. Now he gets his Lasix back. Do you see him as kind of an overwhelming horse that a lot of people obviously are going to lean on, but one that you would also want to lean on, or are you trying to beat him as he returns in the advent stakes? You know, if we were in a situation where they were running Tyler's tribe back uh, without Lasix trying that again, 
then it's something that I, I think I would be uh, completely on board trying to beat. Uh, the fact that the horse bled so bad and they're giving it the remedy in f- the form of Lasix to, to prevent that from happening, it's not the one that I want to try to beat. And so I, I'm really kind of left in a position where I really want to try to find my value underneath uh, in this one. Like, yeah, I think we've done a stream before. You said, okay, we both agree this horse is going to win. The most next important question is going to be who comes in second. Right. And who might that be? You know, I'm kind of, I'm shotgun approaching this. Uh, I, I, so I have a theory with how this track is going to play. Uh, If you're not from this part of the country and you're unaware, uh, it has been just raining uh, basically since the weekend before Thanksgiving. Uh, It's going to clear off tomorrow because the sun only shines on Oakland Park. And uh, you're going to have a, I think you're going to have a really kind of cuppy peanut buttery type surface that you're running in. Um, and I think that saving ground is going to be kind of paramount to uh, horses winning or horses hitting the board. So I'm going to put Tyler's tribe on top and I'm going to basically just wheel in the one, two and three uh, count to Monet, CJ storm and too much info all underneath. Because I think those horses getting more, you know, kind of ground saving trips closer to the rail. Those are going to be the ones that are more likely to sneak into the exotics with Tyler's tribe on top. And I think too, there is a lot of speed signed on for this race. Obviously Tyler's tribe is very fast early and, and has a lot going for him with the return to his preferred surface and getting Lasix back, remedying that sort of issue that he had last time. Um, but if all that speed goes, maybe he is the speed of the speed and survives, but it's going to set up for some of these horses that might want to come from off the pace or more um, ones that kind of default into a placing or finishing third because they just weren't a part of that early pace battle. And I think you're looking at some obviously all of them lately raced horses, but a couple of them that have shown that they can improve from one start to the next, especially the one Count de Monet. Um, And I think too, if you're trying to beat Tyler's tribe, you're probably looking at the number six horse happy as a choice is the most likely alternative to that favorite. Uh, Nine to two on the morning line is your second choice, but there's no value in putting that horse in second. If it's five, six, you don't make any money that's worthwhile here. Right. So you got to find somebody else underneath as your as your long shot if you're putting Tyler's tribe up top. And I liked Happy as a as a choice quite a bit, uh, but I kind of sold out to what I thought my you know my, my diagnosis of how this track was going to play and said, okay, I want to stick with the inside, even though I really like these horses and and kind of went with the the more inside horses uh, underneath. I like it. Well, neither of us trying to beat Tyler's Tribe going into that Advent Stakes on Friday, but we turn the page to a Saturday, and we have two stakes races on Saturday. We have the Ring the Bell Stakes and the Mistletoe Stakes, both listed stakes options, nothing graded yet for this weekend. And in race number seven, I feel like these are just the kind of names that I see over and over again. I'm like, you're still racing? You're still right. out there? <laughs> right. Yeah. A, a lot of these are are very much just Oakland horses that I, you know, as someone who follows the circuit has seen so many times, so, so many times. Uh, also, I, I just, I'm not picking this horse, but I love the reinvention of long range toddy into a sprinter. I, I love it. I, you know, it's, it's a horse that it did its thing in the Kentucky Derby trail. Now it's back. Now they're changing it up, trying to find a spot for it in its older age. And you know, it's, it's, it's a one that you always kind of try to cheer for. I had it in the, uh, in the Arkansas Derby a few years ago when we had to split it into Arkansas Derby and Arkansas Derby part two electric boogaloo whenever uh, Santa Anita was shut down. Right. I remember that split division running and just seeing these horses come back at year after year, you get to be fans of them or you get to try to beat them all the time. And either way, um, supporting the longevity of their careers is something that's always cool to see. Do you have any thoughts of where you're going in this race? It also seems like it's a fairly even morning line with at least four horses being logical options. I'm going to I'm going to lean into uh ha- at what we talked about earlier of being a pretty weird dude. Uh I'm going to go Baytown Bear. Uh I really like Baytown Bear. Can I trust that Mountaineer figure? The fact that that horse just ran rough shot over a Mountaineer field? Maybe not, but here's the deal. Uh, I I mentioned that I really am going to be looking into kind of inside post positions this weekend a lot of it having to do with the weather it's going to be really wet again on saturday uh so i think you know baytown bear has the shot to win the race to the lead the race within the race hit the rail and go and i think it's going to be a tough proposition for anyone to kind of chase down a horse that's on the lead early so considering that to the inside of baytown bear you don't really have a ton of speed that really wants to go i think the horse gets out there to the to the first and then it's catch me if you can and if they catch him 
you know, they, they beat me, but I took my shot with a 15 to one on the morning line. And I can't really, you know, complain if the horse comes up second or third. And I think you're speaking to um, a general train of thought too, that he looks on paper, like kind of that one figure horse, right? When you look last time, it's this huge jump up. It's kind of an anomaly of what we've seen from him on a regular basis. But when you take a one figure horse, you should take them at a price, which is what you're doing instead of taking them as the favorite or the second choice. And if you're getting 15 to one, and he has the potential to be the longest shot in this field by post time. And that jump up last time, uh, maybe is showing that he's improving at the right time for a race like this. You want to take him at the price instead of taking him at a shorter price. So I'm for it. I looked at him and I saw that, uh, that improvement last time. And I was like, can I trust this? I don't know. I had some of the same questions as you did, but I think the price is okay enough to ask those questions for me. You know, my top pick. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, well, I was going to say sometimes on this, on this wet track, you have what I call the rail and trail bias where the rail will be really good. And then way out in the middle in the tractor trail will be great for horses that Kelsey Har usually rides to come closing <laughs> up the middle of the track. I don't think Kelsey Har, Har is riding Boldor, but, uh, I might even take a swing at a Baytown bear Boldor, uh, exacta, which both 15 to one, uh, I, I'm extremely paid if that hits it's uh, it's a long shot, but it will be paid, you know, a- you know, adequately if that actually happens. For sure. I mean, do you subscribe to the notion that turf horses um, run well enough on certain wet surfaces for the dirt? Or do you think it kind of depends on the horse themselves? What surface? How much moisture are we talking about? I wasn't counting on you asking me such polarizing, divisive questions as this, uh, Sarah. <laughs> That's what we're but, here for. <laughs> yeah, I actually, I kind of do. I think of the, the you know, people say it's a myth, the wide turf hoof. Yeah, I, I think the having that wide turf ho- hoof, you know, actually makes sense in these uh, the, these super wet tracks. So, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm with it. I agree. Well, so just supports your exact argument there. Um, I'm looking at one for Richie as a horse that I think will be a fair price, not a great price, but a fair price, uh, mainly for his consistency. Uh, you're looking at a horse that's been winning lately where some of these, I mean, we're talking about a long time since they've really been in consistently good form. Um, Kavod's another one, a short price that I don't know if I'm interested in has some speed, but is this horse going to be the speed of the speed? I don't know. Um, and then I think a lot of people are going to be really attracted to flash of mischief because this isn't the breeder's cup sprint, but is this horse really that good? I don't know. And I mean, you're also looking at a horse that's going to be on the rail. That's never really exactly where you want to be at a short price with um, a race where there might be more speed. So I would probably center most of my plays around uh, one for Richie. Uh, I'm not crazy about chat a lot either. This looks like a race where you don't want to just use all of these short prices all in one and, and basically waste your equity on similar looking profiles. Yeah, if I'm playing this horizontally, I'm I'm probably just going to toss the short price horses and just hope for something kind of, you know, uh, boom worthy to, to come through in that race. I like it. Well, we'll move on to the last stakes race of the weekend that we're going to be chatting about, the mistletoe stakes. And there's a horse in here that I've had um, a lot of success with fading horses related to a race that this one ran in and that's coach who is two to one on the morning line, your second choice in here. But I feel like this horse just always takes a ton of money, especially mm-hmm. with the Brad Cox factor. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, you have a Brad Cox horse named for D Wayne Lucas at Oakland park. Yeah. That's going to, it's going to take all the money. I mean, Jethro is going to show up with the wheelbarrow for, full of money uh, to bet this one in from cave city, Arkansas or wherever booger hollow perhaps. And uh, you know, I, I, I agree with you. It's, it's one that I'm going to try to avoid, but it's because I have a little bit more, I have a little bit of an angle and I also have uh, connections that I, I just, I love if we were on my show, I'd be playing the dirty little pig boy clip. In fact, uh, for, for these connections. All right. Well, tell me all about it because I'm all for fading coach in this spot. Uh, the two ice orchid at five to one on the morning line for short leaf stables, man. I love short leaf stables horses. Uh, you know, if for a long time, it was uh, bill van meter who's training these horses. They he's retired, uh, moved over, I think to, to be a jockey agent. And now he is, uh, and now it's John Ortiz. Who's taking these, uh, these short leaf horses usually split between Cox and, and Ortiz. But, uh, my, my angle here is you have the short stretch mile. The conventional wisdom is you want to be on the lead in the short stretch mile. What happens a lot of times is these races 
artificially blow up pace wise uh, because you have everybody who think they have to be on the lead to win it. And you find horses that pick up the pieces. And I think ice orchid is that horse. Once again, if I'm thinking that inside posts and saving ground is going to be key to victory this weekend, then ice Orchid's is going to be on the rail. Uh, won't have to do very much to get over to it. And we'll be saving all the ground. So I love ice orchid here and uh, you know, a, a tiny upset. I mean, I think when you beat both of those favorites in, uh, the number six horse, Leda Vida, as well as coach. I think that you're looking at something worthwhile here because really, I feel like people are just going to look at those name recognition things and, and really be invested in these kinds of horses. And coach isn't that good. And I've been preaching this for a really long time. Um, I feel like every single week, there is an angle that I've talked about that involves this horse with other horses coming out of races that she's been in lately. And it's been a really key race for me to then fade other horses with what she's done this year. And Battle Bling was one of them because this horse beat her a couple starts ago at Laurel. And I was like, you know, Battle Bling has been running these figures lately with a 92 and a 95 buyer prior to her last start that kind of are just a jump up from what we've been seeing from her normally. And who has she really been beating? Because coach came back in the Chaluki and was fourth and did no running and regressed to a 67 buyer when she had been running more high 80s, 90s. And that was alarming because she has not run something that poor basically since the start of her career. Um, you look at a horse like Nostalgic, who was fast closing into Battle Bling's last start, came back in the Cumley, did no running. So I was like, Battle Bling in her next race? No way do I want any part of that horse whatsoever. And she did no running. So now I definitely don't want coach at a short price, regardless of maybe the lack of class of some of these horses versus her last start, it being that this is not a graded stakes race, it's just a listed stakes. I think that you're looking at Ice Orchid, who finished ahead of her last time. You're looking at another horse at a short price that I would say makes more sense than coach, but I'm trying to beat her as well. And then you're looking at other horses that have had success lately coming into better form recently, such as Will Secret, who if I get 10 to 1 on that horse, I'm happy with that too. So all set with Coach and a couple of the other shorter prices in here. You agree? Uh, agree. <laughs> All right. Well, love to hear it. You can find all of Chase's Oakland picks at picks.horseracingnation.com. I'll be putting them all over the place on our social media as well, because I'm I'm going to look at them myself and see what we've got going on for Oakland. And really just excited for you to get back to uh, your home court so you can thrive yeah. over there. Looking forward to it. Looking forward to, to doing the uh, the tip sheets every day for Oakland. And uh, yeah, I mean, just thank you. Thank you for having me on. I, I always Always love talking to you. Always have you, love having you on the show, the Notorious OTB on the Sports Gambling Podcast Network, if you're unaware. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot. I was always happy to chat with you. And I mean, I loved your podcast episode last week with Jessica Pocket. I'll do a little more shameless promoting for you as well. And I did tell you that I enjoyed the episode before I realized that I was mentioned on it. That's that's the crucial part. I knew, I knew it was genuine whenever you said it then. And then I was like, oh, my name. Like, that's so cool. So that was a great episode to listen to. If you listen to just one of them, go check that one out because that one I felt was really important to the industry as a whole. So I appreciate you taking the time to have those important conversations about people that um, might not get to share a lot of their stories of what they're really going through behind the scenes in, in addition to just the picks and the analysis and all that as well. Yeah, I, I try to do my best to just be myself on my podcast, and I really appreciate people coming in and being their, their themselves and telling, talking about their lives. You know, honestly, like Jess did, and it was it was great. It was a really fun show to record, and like, and I'm glad you thought it was important. I, I felt it was, you know, an important one also. All right, well, go check that out if you haven't already. Make sure you subscribe to the Horse Racing YouTube channel and get over to picks.horseracingnation.com. Good luck this weekend.